Hello. And thank you for coming today. What a nice room, boy. How many people have heard Dr. Doyle talk before? How many people it's your first time? Now you can see where the other half came from. This will not be your first time. We want to thank everybody for coming here. Look at all the people up here. And these people are a little closer to the sun where they're sitting. So, um, this talk is being sponsored by 10th Church of Christ Scientists in Los Angeles. And uh, they wanted me to announce that you'll like what you see here today. They got another one coming up in about a month. John Tyler, Christian Science Lecturer and Teacher from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, will be giving a talk on November the 10th, entitled, What's Beyond the Sixth Sense? Yes. Sounds like a movie, doesn't it? There are flyers outside, but it's going to be held at uh, the 10th Church Press Scientist on Monday Avenue in West Los Angeles, um, November 10th, Sunday, November 10th at 2 p.m., so please join us then. Our speaker today is Dr. Lawrence Doyle. Um, when I was about four or five, my first memory of childhood was walking out on a dark summer night into our backyard. I looked up, the sky was black, full of stars, and just having this sense of absolute perfect peace that I came from there. And it, I, it's a memory I've never forgotten. It's my first clear memory of childhood. And from that moment on, I was never, ever afraid of the dark as a kid. And it started an absolute love of astronomy, a love of science fiction that has stayed with me my whole life. I have a feeling that a lot of people in this room have had a similar experience of some kind, where they felt this connection to the stars, to outer space, to a oneness of everything. When our guest, Dr. Doyle, was six years old, his dad gave him a map of the solar system and showed him that the sun was actually just a very close star. And he started thinking, well, what about all those stars out there? There must be people living out there among those stars. Years later, in an interview, he said, I wondered how many of these people spoke Spanish. <laughs> Which, growing up in California, was my nearest six-year-old concept of another culture. I never thought of specializing in astronomy, but of learning about the folks who live among the stars. Well, I think perhaps it was this desire to find out about folks who live among the stars that may very well have been the impetus for a big change in young Lawrence's life. Lawrence Doyle attended San Diego State University where he received his bachelor's and master's degree in astronomy and went to work at the Space Image Processing Group at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory working on the Voyager mission. You may have heard the news recently that that Voyager is out of the solar system now. Um, he went on to receive his doctorate in 1987 at the uh, University of Heidelberg in Heidelberg, Germany, and from then on till now, he has been the um, uh, investigator and astrophysicist at the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California. SETI, of course, standing for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. His four duties there have been the photometric finding of other planets around those stars. Sound like something that happened when he was six determining if any of those planets are habitable. The third one, and I really think this is fascinating to me, is the application of information theory to animals, such as his work with dolphins, finding out that the squeaks and squawks that they talk to each other actually are a language. They are talking back and forth to each other in an intelligent language. And the reason this is important to astrophysicists is they're always picking up squeaks and squawks from outer space. How do they find out if this is a real language or not? This is what that study does. He also is working on the development of quantum astronomy. He's also a member of the NASA um, Kepler mission team, science team. And they have a very specific mission. They're also looking for planets, but they're specifically looking for Earth-type planets around double star systems. It turns out most of the stars in our galaxy are double star systems, two stars that revolve around each other. How many people remember uh, Star Wars, where Luke Skywalker walks out in Tatooine at night and sees the two suns that are setting? Well, Dr. Doyle and his team recently found Tatooine. 
<laughs> they found a planet surrounding a double star system where you would look up and you would see that at sunset. I think it's just fascinating. Um, he loves teaching and he is on the he's a visiting faculty member at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Yep, and also Principia College and teaches subjects as diverse as quantum astronomy all the way up to history of Native American cultures. How many people here wish they could find stars? <laughs> well, now you can. He's also president of something called Planet Quest, which uses a website and, and um, probably a phone app and, and a screensaver, and it allows millions and millions of people from all around the world to connect through their computers to do two things. One is to learn more about the latest things going on in astronomy, and second of all, to become part of this worldwide group through your home computer, all these computers connected together, making one really, really big computer helping to find extra planets out there. Isn't that cool? <laughs> and you don't have to go to Heidelberg. <laughs> he also loves Christian science. And he has been a, uh, on the board of lectureship for the Christian Science uh, Board of Lectureship, as well as a contributing editor and writer for the Christian Science periodicals, including Christian Science Journal, Christian Science Sentinel, and the Christian Science Monitor. He's also addressed more than a dozen Christian Science associations. Mrs. Eddy has a quote. She says, the astronomer will no longer look up to the stars. He will look out from them upon the universe. I think Mrs. Eddy would be very pleased to learn that Dr. Doe and his colleagues are already doing this today. It's pretty humbling. His talk today is entitled Physics and Metaphysics. Please join me in welcoming back to Los Angeles, the City of Angels, Dr. Lawrence Thorpe. The astronomer will no longer look up to the stars, look out from them, from the universe. Notice that the astronomer is singular and the stars are plural. So it's not talking, Miss Day wasn't talking about space travel. She's talking about looking out from all the stars. So that's clearly the perspective of divine mind. Okay, physics and metaphysics. Well, recently I've started to work in the field of quantum astronomy, which isn't really a field yet. We're inventing it, my colleague and I. And it's extending unusual quantum weirdness to interplanetary and even interstellar and even intergalactic scales. Some of that will come into play today because basically what I wanted to do today is discuss the current state of where physics is, especially quantum physics, because quantum physics is what is driving the scientific community's conception of underlying reality. So first we're going to like discuss Christian science a little, then physics, quantum physics, what has been the progress in quantum physics over the last hundred years, and then in that context we're going to stick Christian science with, along with Christian science being a science, and also Christianity being a science. Does that make sense? So that's what we're going to try and do. I have never given this particular talk, although some things will sound familiar. If you have not heard of Christian science or heard a talk like this before, you may be asking why an astrophysicist, quantum physicist, is talking about Christian science, which most people think of as a religion. How many people here are non-Christian scientists? Oh, sure. Okay. Well, <laughs> when I first went to teach at Principia, I grew up by myself, you know, with my brother and sister in Cambria, and we had a very small Sunday school, and I never heard of Principia College, which is a Christian science college. But I didn't know that. And I was invited back to teach astronomy. And um, I asked the class, just in general, anybody here Buddhist? And everybody laughed. And I thought there was something funny about being a Buddhist. <laughs> And I thought, wait a second, how many people here are Christians? And everybody raised their hand. How many people here are Christian scientists? Everybody raised their hand. It's like, this is a Christian science school. <laughs> people don't tell me anything. <laughs> so why is a scientist here discussing, well, religion? Is there, there are many aspects of Christian science. It is a theological system, and it is also a healing system. And the textbook of Christian Science, called Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, has science, medicine, 
and theology there from the title. We can touch on these aspects, but today's talk will be primarily about its scientific aspects. What Christian science states about reality is, of course, essential to its healing and its religious and spiritual aspects. One could say that Christian science heals with reality. We'll get back to this in a minute, but to consider the scientific aspects and using the popular terms in quantum physics that Nick Herbert uh, uses, some people consider science as a cookbook. You plug in equations and turn the crank. But most scientists I know consider science to be more like a guidebook, a methodology with which one can discover, can discover reality. Now Einstein was of this latter persuasion. He once said, I'm not interested in the color of this or the spectrum of that. I want to know what God thinks. The rest are details. The discoverer and founder of Christian Science, Mary Baker Eddy, wrote the textbook of Christian Science in 1875 with various revisions thereafter into the first decade of the 20th century. This was well within the era that we might call Victorian, Victorian physics, where matter was thought to be solid, the atom immutable, and the scientist was an objective observer wholly outside whatever experiment he was doing. I should point out that we'll be discussing quantum physics largely today as it seems to be experimentally unfolding in the most profound changes in any field of physics as to the, what the perception of reality is. The conceptual changes are so different that physics before quantum physics is known as classical physics. And quantum physics and fields closely related are now known as modern physics. So classical physics is 2,000, 3,000 years before quantum physics and everything after quantum physics is modern physics. That's how profound the change is. So the very paradigm of what science is, is being changed by quantum physics. Christian science was already well established by the time the quantum in 1900 was first hypothesized by a gentleman named Max Planck. Am I going too fast? Okay. Let me know if you're completely is going to do a little bit of physics here, but no equations. That generally clears the room. <laughs> we should acknowledge Ludwig Boltzmann in 1877 first suggested the quanta of energy. Now, what is a quanta? It's a little quantity. So, in other words, Max Planck was using a trick of mathematics that quantized energy and basically said the universe is digital. But he just did it theoretically. Uh, then Albert Einstein came along and he explained something called the photoelectric effect, which everybody was perplexed about, <coughs> using Max Planck's idea of quanta. So it's like everybody's going after, after Einstein. Wow, could that really be the case? The universe is digitized? Eventually, quantum would even go on to digitize time. You know, we're not going in time, we're going and space too, if you look close to That's called a well, quantum cosmology. <laughs> but I digress. Anyway, the uh, um, Nobel Prize was awarded in 1921 to Einstein for his application of the quanta. So his, his major work was quantum physics up until then. And Max Planck got the 1918 Nobel Prize. The quantum theory is an innocent sounding idea that energy comes in an irreducible packet or quantity. As mentioned, quantum theory can also include the digitization, as I said, of other units. Not only are electrons digital and so on, but even space and time. Now that sounds innocent enough until you begin working with it. So what we're going to be discussing today is a bit about this revolution in light of what Christian science has to say about the nature of reality. So as I said, we're going to outline quantum and then put Christian science in the middle. We're not making a case for quantum physics stating the same conclusions regarding the nature of reality as Christian science does in this age. If quantum physics is turning into Christian science, that's okay with me. Uh, let's stay tuned. That's a SETI saying right away. <laughs> but we are going to be discussing what Mrs. Eddy discovered about reality that predates discoveries in quantum physics by more than half a century 
and in no way is in conflict with what quantum physics is unfolding. So quantum physics is, in my opinion, is playing catch up to Christian science. Oh, there I said it. Anybody wants to leave? <laughs> That's what you're getting today. Mrs. Eddy's writings on Christian science span the last quarter of the 19th century and the first decade of the 20th. Writings in quantum physics started in the year 1900, but theories and interpretations of quantum physics with regard to fundamental reality didn't really begin until the 1920s and pretty much wrapped up by the 1930s. Now, all the interpretations of quantum physics, what's really going on, are weird. I'm going to present the mainstream one, which is nothing exists till it's observed. That's the easiest one to accept. <laughs> there are parallel universes. There are all sorts of odd things. Writings of quantum physics began about the 1920s as far as interpretation goes. By the way, the field of quantum physics that deals with interpretation is often referred to by physicists as the measurement problem. So if you want to look it up, the reality studies of quantum physics are known as the measurement problem. It seems because when you go to measure something, it behaves as you want it to. If you set up an experiment to measure an electron as a wave, it'll act like a wave. If you set it up to act like a particle, it'll act like a particle. If you look away, it'll look like a wave again. If you look back, it becomes a particle. Also, the experimenter cannot be separated from the experiment. Einstein's colleague, uh, Princeton University professor John Wheeler, called this the participatory universe. So in other words, the universe is always participating in things that you do. So let's pause here for a moment in case you're asking, so is this a talk about Christian science or quantum physics? And why is this guy comparing religion with science? So for the non-Christian scientists in the audience, I should point out that Christian scientists consider Christian science a science. So the point of today's talk is to outline what Christian scientists view as reality and note that progress in physics, quantum physics in particular, appears to have been heading in such in a much metaphysical direction for almost a century now. now I call quantum physicists the reluctant metaphysician. <laughs> <laughs> because they've gone kicking, screaming, and biting into the land of metaphysics. But they've used the scientific method to guide them. So if you stick to the scientific method, it leads you in a metaphysical direction when you go to understand reality. Once again, the idea is the scientific method is a guidebook, not a cookbook. Although my quantum physics professor, I would ask lots and lots and lots of questions all the time, and he finally said, shut up and calculate. <laughs> so some people's attitude is, you know, this is just to turn the crank. We don't need to understand what quantum physics is all about. So this Victorian notion of what we determine scientifically represents reality was dropped for a better part of a century. And I'll get to why it's now respectable to study quantum physics measurement problems, whereas it wasn't three decades ago. The idea that a scientific method is a guidebook rather than a cookbook, and that through the hypothesis of theory, logical deduction of consequences, and then experimental verification of those consequences, one may safely arrive at the actual nature of things without fooling oneself. So in other words, you get this inspiration. You deduce logically what the results of that inspiration should be, and then you do an experiment to see if it's right. That's the scientific method. Mrs. Eddy talks about this in terms of Christian science terms. We call this revelation, reason, and demonstration. So let's start with an overview of natural science, a real quick one. Over the past 400 years or so, what has occurred has been called the scientific revolution. Religious beliefs have often seemed to have been in conflict with these discoveries in science. First there was conflict with the astronomers 400 years ago. Then the church was in conflict with the geologists over the age of the earth. Then they were in conflict with Darwin over biology. And they should have been in conflict with the quantum physicists, but that was too complex. So they went out and beat up, they decided to beat up the biologists again. <laughs> anyway, that's, I teach a history of science class, and, uh, okay. I have 
great respect for everybody involved. <laughs> I've also thought that it's somewhat unusual because discoveries in science have pretty much always pointed in the metaphysical direction, or spiritual direction, if you will, from the start. The universe got bigger. Instead of the Earth being at the center, the Earth was in orbit around the sun. The Pope said, well, if the Earth's in orbit, what's the need for salvation? He basically said, if the Earth is in heaven. Well, by deprovincializing our thinking about the solar system, the scientific revolution took off. Suddenly, we were participants in a bigger universe. Today, we're in the same spot, but what we have to deprovincialize is our notion of mind. Instead of one little mind that's in the center of our own conscious universe, we have to give it up to be ideas in the infinite divine mind. And um, I can answer questions about that too, because the main thing is physics, quantum physics, and this one about astrophysics. The most famous first conflicts in the Western science tradition started with what has been called the Copernican Revolution. Literally about revolution, that is, the revolution of the Earth around the Sun, or the Sun around the Earth. To hypothesize that the Earth went around the Sun rather than the reverse was to go up against the most obvious evidence of the senses. Well, what other evidence is there? How could one go against the obvious evidence that the Sun circled the Earth? Don't we still use the term sunrise and sunset? Yet today, we take the evidence of intelligence on that matter as superior to the evidence of the senses and we affirm that the Earth is in orbit around the Sun. So the key to the scientific revolution that started 400 years ago was beginning to take the evidence of intelligence as superior to the evidence of the senses. So anyone that says that science is taking the evidence of the senses, that's not what science does. Isaac Asimov said that science, he was in an interview with Bill Moyers, he said that Science is when you compare your thoughts with those of the universe to see if they match. That's much more science. So, if one takes things too literally in religion, one may miss important metaphors. For example, Psalm 18 states that God is a rock. We don't take that literally, right? God's a rock. So, it's a, it's a metaphor. Also, there's a kind of literalism in science, and it's called materialism. And it would say that the evidence of the material senses is more reliable than the evidence of intelligence, which is not true in science. To use our example, the Earth going around the sun is just one of many instances where reality is in direct conflict with the senses. This illustrates what the philosopher and mathematician Bertrand Russell said. <coughs> He said, physics is based on the idea that things are as they appear, and then it proceeds to prove that things are not as they appear. <laughs> <laughs> the phraseology in the Christian science lingo is mortal mind outgrowing itself. I can put it in physics too for any physicists. I can go back and forth. <laughs> this is actually the march of science. The evidence of the senses are to be examined in the light of the scientific method and the evidence of intelligence is taken to be superior to, and more reliable than, the evidence of the senses. I went to a talk once, and the lady in the middle of the talk held up a cowbell and rang it, and she just wouldn't stop till we all woke up. <laughs> she did. I thought the first ding, 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 I could still have dozed off, but it just kept going. <laughs> so consider cowbell. One might start the revision in physics away from matter as being substantial with what is called the gold foil experiment in quantum physics. In 1909, two students working under the experimental physicist Ernest Rutherford did this experiment. They shot alpha particles through gold foil. <coughs> they were surprised that most of the alpha particles went on through, but occasionally one bounced right back at them. Well, this was not what you might call a plum pudding model of the atom. This was something else. What they, the only solution they could think of was that the nucleus of the atom was in the middle and way far away with the electron. Now, if the nucleus is the size of a pea, the electron would be a dust mote about a mile away. So people were surprised, like, well, things are not substantial, are they? Matter is not as solid as the 
Victorian physicists thought. People today talk about matter being mostly empty space using analogies such as if the atomic nucleus is this size, if you took all the space between the atoms and the Earth out, it would be a black hole about half an inch across. So the Earth with no space between the atoms forming a black hole is half an inch across the whole Earth. So your own body is, of course, an angstrom. <laughs> it's little. <laughs> it's really little. You have trouble finding in the microscope. So why are we all puffed up? Well, <laughs> out that light is transmitting between electrons. It's called, it transmits what's called the Coulomb force. So technically, from a physics viewpoint, your body is puffed up by light. That's kind of an interesting analogy. Right? So it was only the beginning of the undermining of the Victorian conception of substantiality or substantial objective matter. What has occurred in quantum physics over the last century is a whole lot more radical than even that. Max Planck's theory of the light quanta, that light comes in little irreducible packets of energy, explained a certain experimental result called the ultraviolet catastrophe. And this idea gained further credibility as Einstein used it to, to solve the photoelectric effect. Now, Einstein did not get the Nobel Prize, as I mentioned, for relativity, because nobody understood it. <laughs> Bless their heart. So, <laughs> they, they, gave it, they knew something neat had happened, so he was given the Nobel Prize for something else that were a little more safe. Little did they know that quantum physics was the least safe thing, you know, the most radical thing at the time. But then we fast forward to the middle 1920s and 1930s, when quantum physics theory really starts to take on some very interesting aspects. It turns out that elementary particles, the constituents of matter, behave as both particles and as waves, depending on how the experiment is set up. Later, it would turn out that if you switch the experiment faster than light, it can accommodate changing faster than light. To handle this wave nature, Erwin Schrodinger came up with what's known as the Schrodinger wave equation, which quantum physicists use extensively today. It took into account the wave nature of particles, but does not address the change from wave to particle or vice versa. Nobody can solve that jump. Werner Heisenberg at the same time formulated what is known as the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which I always thought was a funny name <laughs> since principle means certain. You know, like that. <laughs> like jumbo shrimp, you know. We <laughs> <laughs> but things were shortly to become, at least in the view of the solid matter physicists of the Victorian era, very mysterious. A guy named Max Born at University of Göttingen in Germany wrote a paper that stated that Schrodinger's waves were really only waves of probability. Now that's really off the deep end. <laughs> waves of probability. So. According to quantum physics, you hold a dice in your hand. But if you, if you measure it, if there's some way you can tell what you're holding, in other words, it doesn't become a, a, a cube of dice until you roll it. What you're holding is a bunch of one-sixths, whatever that means, until you roll it. And you can do experiments to show that particles don't exist until they're rolled, they're observed. Okay, one physicist describes Born's interpretation as saying, he described it this way, matter is a tendency to exist. <laughs> so what makes it seem to become something then? Soon after these two breakthroughs, Niels Bohr of the University of Copenhagen, who would debate Albert Einstein the rest of his life, and Einstein, came up with what is known as the Copenhagen interpretation, named after his city. This is the basic idea that elementary particles do not exist until they're observed. This is currently the mainstream interpretation of quantum physics. If you want to know any of the others, I'm happy to point them out, but they're much weirder. <laughs> now, Einstein was not very happy with this interpretation. He and Niels Bohr argued about it for decades, and these were the big guys. Schrodinger sided with Einstein, and Heisenberg sided with Bohr, but it was debated for decades. Bohr was saying that nothing exists until it is observed, while 
Einstein wanted to know what, that the laws of the universe were independent of the observer. Any physicists in the audience, by the way? Great. Well, correct me if I am. Okay. <laughs> I'll just uh, throw out an opinion here based upon Christian science training. I think Niels Bohr was relatively correct, but Einstein was absolutely correct. <laughs> That's a very quantum answer. Quantum, it's yes, no, or no, yes. A quantum computer doesn't have zeros and ones, it has zero ones and one zero. In Christian science language, one might extrapolate a bit and say that Bohr was saying that matter and mortal mind are the same thing. Einstein was saying that there is one principle, what Christian science would call infinite mind, that operates independent of human consciousness. So, but whenever anybody did an experiment, Bohr was correct. So right now in the literature of physics, you'll read that Bohr won the argument. But Einstein came up with something which I'll discuss here later that truly showed the weirdness of Bohr's interpretation. Trying to clarify their interpretations of quantum reality, let's take a look at some of the statements of the founders of quantum physics. Werner Heisenberg stated, quote, Some physicists would prefer to come back to the idea of an objective real world whose smallest parts exist objectively in the same sense as stones or trees exist independently of whether we observe them. This, however, is impossible. You want to hear that again? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Some physicists would prefer to come back to the idea of an objective real world whose smallest parts exist objectively in the same sense as stones or trees exist, independently of whether we observe them. This, however, is impossible. No going back to the objective Victorian idea. It is interesting that Mary Baker Eddy wrote almost 50 years before this that the material atom is an outlying falsity of consciousness. Way ahead. Erwin Schrödinger acknowledged that allu the illusory nature of physical reality, but also recognized that this illusion might not be overcome with physics alone. He wrote, Discoveries in physics cannot in themselves, so I believe, have the authority of forcing us to put an end to the habit of picturing the physical world as a reality. Want to do that one again? <laughs> they have a way of saying these things so they're profound. <laughs> Discoveries in physics cannot in themselves, so I believe, have the authority of forcing us to put an end to the habit of picturing the physical world as a reality. So it's a habit. And he's saying it's a hard habit to break. <laughs> and that physics is probably not up to the job. I think Christian science is up to the job. We'll discuss that in a moment. Schrodinger, Erwin Schrodinger of the Schrodinger equation. Now, physicists resisted this metaphysicalization of physics. Even when I was first taking quantum physics as an undergraduate, the attitude toward interpretations of quantum physics were more or less, like I said, be quiet and calculate. We were being told that at least with regard to quantum physics, we were to regard physics as a cookbook. Sir Arthur Eddington, who confirmed Einstein's theory of relativity, wrote this insightful statement. <clears throat> it is difficult for the matter-of-fact physicist to accept the view that the substratum of everything is of mental character. But no one can deny that mind is the first and most direct thing in our experience, and that everything else is remote inference. That's pretty good. <laughs> you want to hear it again? No? Okay, I'll read it again. <clears throat> it is difficult for the matter-of-fact physicist to accept the view that the substratum of everything is of mental character. But no one can deny that mind is the first and most direct thing in our experience, and that everything else is remote inference. But now the question arose, so what makes observations and who is the observer? We're talking about observer-created reality. If the chicken is the wave and the egg is the particle, which came first, the chicken or the egg, it's the chicken. I think this is pretty interesting in light of biology saying that electrons in the brain synapses produce consciousness because consciousness is required to make the electron. <laughs> Something is 
short circuit here. <laughs> in the 1930s, Einstein, along with colleagues Boris Podolsky and Nathan Rosen, pointed out what is now called the EPR paradox. They showed that if one measured one particle of an entangled pair of elementary particles, like electrons, that the other particle would immediately respond faster than light. Einstein called this spooky action at a distance. <laughs> <laughs> and the EPR guys took this to mean that quantum physics must be missing something. They did not recognize it. That they, there's no way they entertained the idea that spooky action at a distance would really be happening. So Einstein, one of three times he did this, predicted something and didn't believe it. So he was right three times when he thought he was wrong. He was wrong three times. Now I knew one of those. But actually Einstein and his team had discovered one of the most interesting aspects of quantum physics and instantaneous connectedness underlying everything. It must have been difficult for the discoverer of relativity, which is based on the idea that nothing can exceed the speed of light, to discover that, not, that this does not hold for entangled elementary particles. This is one of three times, as I said, Einstein was wrong or discovered stuff that he didn't believe. Einstein was up, <coughs> excuse me, Einstein was up visiting Hubble in 1938 at Mount Wilson Observatory, and this is Hubble was taking Mrs. Einstein around, showing her the telescope and all. As you know, Hubble discovered the universe was expanding. And Mrs. Hubble pointed to the 100 inch telescope and the dome and all, and she said, This is what my husband uses to discover that the universe is expanding. And Mrs. Einstein said, it's a really beautiful telescope. My husband does the same thing with a pencil. <laughs> okay, let's jump ahead a little. And uh, to the discovery of John Bell of CERN in Switzerland in 1964. And apologies if I skipped your favorite physicist. If you want to ask them, throw them in and what they did. There's, you know, I know there's Dirac and Fermi and Pauli and Bohm and Feynman and all those guys. Inspired by the EPR paper and others, John Bell came up with an experiment that could actually measure spooky action at a distance, if it existed. <coughs> Almost two decades later, Alan Aspect in Paris would actually perform this experiment and spooky action at a distance, or entanglement, became a real thing. Entanglement is now a well-known fact of quantum physics. Entanglement is when two particles are really one particle, even though one's way over there and one's way over there. What do you do that one? happens to that one faster than light? They're already one particle. That's the interpretation. They look like two, but they're really one. I got eight. A Victorian look there. <laughs> Is that string theory? Well, yeah, just, just, yeah. String theory requires 11 dimensions, and it applies to elementary particles. So, yeah. Um, quantum and computers. We'll get to that. What? Is it reflecting? Yes. Yes. And it doesn't have to go forward in time either. We'll get to that in a second. So John Bell came up with the actual experiment, and Alan Aspect performed it. There exists an immediate connectedness underlying the universe at the most basic level. This was mostly considered in the physics community as just a philosophical aspect of quantum physics until the early 1990s. It appeared to become feasible to consider building such things as quantum computers that would use this weird aspect to do things regular computers couldn't do. Suddenly, all the weird aspects of quantum physics might be used to build quantum computers. Of course, the components of the computer would be, you know, elementary particles. So anything elementary particles can do, uh, the quantum computer could do. These quantum computers would use elementary particles as their switching units, keep their virtual memories in other dimensions, 11 if you believe believe string theory. If you got a computer, it's virtual memory is in 11 dimensions. And also, possibly be able to work backward in time to 
depending on what elementary particle. There's a K0 particle that is asymmetric in time, so that might not work. If you use K0 particles, k will not work in a quantum computer, I think, because they're time asymmetric. They're the only, they're the only equations that if you run them backward, you get a different answer than if you run them forward. Everything else doesn't matter. You go, let's go backward. Okay, there we go. Physics says, fine with us. We're going backward in time. Maybe let's go forward. Bing. Now we're all going forward. We couldn't tell. Elementary quantum computers are being built today. NASA just purchased one for about 25 million. But real quantum computers are still to come, ones that are truly 100% quantum computers. These, these quantum computers that NASA bought are kind of like the Apple II or the Apple I or something, which is this little box, and everybody bought it and said, look at my computer. Nobody knew what to do with it. More neat programs. But you could show your friends that this was a computer. That thing on my desk. Now, I'd like to bring in a bit about Christian science in line of these discoveries. Hopefully, we've painted a very rough mosaic of quantum physics. Some physicists I know keep their physics on one side and their religion on the other. This is, the religion is faith and their physics is thinking. I would say that this would even be the attitude of the majority of physicists I know that are also religious. Religion applies to the faith world and physics to the material world. So they keep this dichotomy, this two worlds, the spiritual one and the material one. And you just don't cross, they just don't relate. But as we have seen, this handy division may not be so clear these days. Although the discovery of Christian science in 1866 took place well before the discovery of quantum physics, one of the biographers of Mary Baker Eddy, uh, Robert Peel, wrote this. Only after the successive emergence of relativity and quantum theory could even the most rudimentary conceptual bridges be thrown between, for instance, Mrs. Eddy's explanations of mind, matter, and causation, and those of the more philosophically minded scientists. <coughs> so it took, according to Robert Peel, relativity and quantum physics to bring natural scientists up to a discussion of the level that Mrs. Eddy was already working at. <coughs> now, Mrs. Eddy is usually acknowledged as a pioneer in theology. Uh, she founded a religion and so on. And also as a pioneer in healing, people are going, well, maybe the thought of the patient has something to do with what happened, you know, whether they're cured. And she was a pioneer in that sort of thing. But she is generally not acknowledged as a pioneer in, as a pioneer in science. And I'd like to bring out that aspect. That, I think, is the next aspect of her <coughs> remarkable discovery. So, what is reality is a very important question in the application of Christian science. Perhaps a good place to start for a concise statement of Christian science is the section that starts with what Christian scientists know as the scientific statement of being. You'll find that in the Christian science textbook, Science and Health, which uh, you get can get a copy on your way out if you want. Yeah. I mean, Christian science don't really convert people. They're not interested in that. They're interested in healing people, and what's between you and God is your business. So relax. This isn't like... <laughs> Neither, quantum physicists don't convert people either. They generally leave it up to you to run from the physics hall. <laughs> okay. What is the scientific statement of being? Quote, there is no life, truth, intelligence, nor substance in matter. All is infinite mind and its infinite manifestation. For God is all in all. Spirit is immortal truth, matter is mortal error. Spirit is the real and eternal, matter is the unreal and temporal. Spirit is God and man is his image and likeness, therefore man is not material, he is spiritual. Well, in the context of quantum physics, isn't that kind of an interesting statement? I've heard it all my life, but in the context of quantum physics, I thought that's pretty profound stuff and way ahead of its time, more than a quarter century before the discovery of the quantum. So in line with this, let's go back to the question then of who is ultimately doing the observing. Mary Baker Eddy writes, the fading forms of matter, the mortal body and material earth are the fleeting concepts of the human mind. <clears throat> they have their day before the permanent facts and their perfection in spirit appear. Continuing the quote, 
The crude creations of mortal thought must finally give place to the glorious forms which we sometimes behold in the camera of divine mind when the mental picture is spiritual and eternal. Mortals must, must look beyond fading finite forms if they would gain the true sense of things. Where shall the gaze rest but in the unsearchable realm of mind? So is it that there is ultimately only one infinite observer, divine mind that creates the universe by thinking? As one lecturer said, God doesn't just think of you, he, he thinks you up. <laughs> Mrs. Eddy writes presently, a material world implies a mortal mind and man a creator. In other words, a material observer. The scientific divine creation declares immortal mind and the universe created by God. If you like to use mind instead or great cause or anything, you can substitute whatever you're comfortable with. Quote, infinite mind creates and governs all from the mental molecule to infinity. The divine principle of all expresses science and art throughout his creation and the immortality of man and the universe. So as far as Christian science goes, there's, it's unequivocal who the observer is. When Jesus said, I can of my own self do nothing, he didn't say, I can of my own self do very little. He said, nada. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, let me just translate the Bible into Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> so where in quantum, is quantum physics theory right now? I would say that what is going on in the quantum physics community today, among other things, it's discovery that mortal mind and matter are the same thing. That's about what quantum physics is. I think uh, Niels Bohr was correct. One cannot separate the observer from the observation at this material experimental level. But with the discovery of John Bell, he basically discovered reality is non-local. That's Bell's theory. Reality is non-local. You can't have a local reality, including consciousness. Consciousness is non-local. To put it in the physics lingo, consciousness is a field, not a particle. You say that to a physicist, and they go, that's an interesting idea. You say, all is infinite mind, for God is all in all, and he's not going to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, non-local consciousness is where I think physics is going, but hasn't gotten there yet. In other words, in physics we go, a field always means, like a gravitational field, means going on forever and filling the universe, more or less. Okay, this certainly conflicts with current notions of consciousness in the brain, as I pointed out. Now, Christian science is based upon the idea that Christ Jesus' teachings were scientific. That is based upon the fact of a deeper understanding of reality. Best question I ever got in the planetarium. This little girl said, the stars are so far away, how do we know their names? <laughs> <laughs> no amount of astrophysical training gets you ready for the kids. <laughs> I explained, we don't know what they call themselves, but we give them nicknames like, you know, BD16516. <laughs> Now, Christian science is based upon the idea that Christ Jesus' teachings were scientific. That is, based upon the fact of a deeper understanding of reality. Mrs. Eddy writes, Jesus of Nazareth was the most scientific man that ever trod the globe. He plunged beneath the material surface of things and found the spiritual cause. Christ Jesus said of his mission, To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. He didn't say I came to found a religion or to do miracles that, that set aside the laws of the universe to impress people into certain religious behavior. He said, I have come to bear witness to the truth. So that's a pretty scientific thing to say. He did not say that he alone could work the rules of the universe either. If you lived 2,000 years ago, you wanted to teach the idea that experimental results are more reliable than human opinion, how would you tell your disciples that? How would you get that idea across in Bible language? When Christ Jesus was asked who bore witness of him, he replied that it was not human authority that witnessed to the truth that he taught, 
He said, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that this witness, which he witnesseth of me, is true. You sent unto John, that's John the Baptist, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony of man. I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. So if you call the principle or cause of the universe Father, which is really great, the bigger the galaxies get, and that's your Father. It's really great stuff. You don't feel insignificant because that's your Father doing that. And he said, John's a great witness, but my witness is greater and it's experimentally verified works. So his works bear witness of him. That's extremely scientific, especially for 2,000 years ago. And then he says, and the source of those works is a principle, is a father, is a source of the universe. He said, I'm not the source. So Christ has said that rather than even the highest human authority, it was his healing works that were the true test of the truth he taught. This is a very scientific approach. How much of religion has historically rested upon human authority? And how much has rather rested upon following the works of Christ Jesus? As I studied more about what Christ Jesus said regarding his mission, I again saw the emphasis again on demonstration of the truth. He didn't say a truth or truths. He said the truth. He said specifically also, if I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. That's also very scientific. If it can't be experimentally verified, do not believe it. Are we all on the same page? Are we good? Oh, he's left going, I thought we were talking about Heisenberg or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is a mix and match, which is the idea of this talk. In modern scientific language, we might say, you do not, you are not to blindly believe a theory without experimental verification. This is a tenet of the natural science community. Christ Jesus said, by their fruits ye shall know them. Mary Baker Eddy said, our master taught no mere theory, doctrine, or belief. It was the divine principle of all real being which he taught and practiced. His proof of Christianity was no former system of religion and worship, but Christian science, working out the harmony of life and love. We read, Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus said, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. So Jesus was unequivocal about the scientific method. Jesus summarized it for Pilate when he said, uh, asked him if you were a king, and he said, that's when he said, I came to bear witness to the truth. So if the truth overcomes, if the truth overcomes sin, sickness, and death, then these things must not be true. Okay, we're doing real good. We're almost done. <coughs> and I'll leave time for questions. Mrs. Eddy writes in the Christian Science textbook, It has been said, and truly, that Christianity must be science, and science must be Christianity, else one or the other is false and useless. But neither is unimportant or untrue, and they are alike in demonstration. This proves the one to be identical with the other. That's really scientific, too. I just... How can you tell if they're identical? Well, if you, they're alike in demonstration. If they produce the same experimental results, they must be the same thing. So let me see if I can summarize. We've taken a quick look at quantum physics to see it evolving toward a more metaphysical interpretation of reality. This includes such aspects as underlying immediate interconnectedness. We've seen that progress in this direction as to the interpretation of reality <clears throat> to have been foreseen by Mary Baker Eddy and the discovery of Christian science. We also take a quick, took a quick glance at the teachings of Christ Jesus through the filter of the scientific method and argued for the credibility of seeing Christ Jesus' words as teaching about underlying scientific spiritual reality. And as I said, if you're interested in learning more about this, the Christian Science textbook is available to you.
It is a religious book and it is a healing book. But you might find it also interesting to read it as a book of science about what underlying reality is. It says thank you. 